Good morning, everyone. How are you this snowy, chilly day in February? Wanted to welcome you to Collington virtually with um, some of our amazing residents here as we present what I love about Collington. Uh, for those of you that I haven't met, my name is Sandy Short. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing. And um, before we get started, I'd like to introduce everyone that we have on this call. Um, we have um, Corey Hall. He is our Associate Director of Sales and Marketing. Uh, we have Tia Irvin. She is our Senior Residency Counselor and Move Manager. And we have uh, Terry Mosley. She is our marketing coordinator. So uh, welcome on behalf of marketing. Um, now I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have Joyce Cook. She is a resident here. She's gonna talk a little bit more about her experiences. We have Glenn Johnson, Sue Blanchett, and Howard Pegee. And I do wanna share, we do hope to have some time at the end for questions and answers. So feel free to, in the chat bar or in the Q&As, uh, please feel free to um, post your questions and we will try our best to get to those. If we do run out of time, our residents are always eager and happy to um, answer any offline as well. So without further ado, I'm gonna uh, have Joyce get started and uh, share her experiences here at Collington. So thanks and welcome. Good morning, everybody. My name is Joyce Cook. I am a resident of Collington for the last seven years. Our journey here began, I would say, in 2008 or nine, when my husband Carl and I first decided that it was about time that we should start looking into senior living. We were in a lovely two-story house in Annapolis, Maryland with our dog, and we found that as time passed, we would probably get to the point where it would be more and more difficult to handle the stairs that we um, had. So we started looking at that time, but like so many people, we said, oh, we're just not quite ready yet. And so we put that aside and restarted our search in 2013. And that's when we first met Sandy. And from there, it was just one thing after another until we moved in in early 2014. Um, my husband is local, so it was important to him that we be somewhat accessible to Washington, D.C. And certainly Collington has that uh, benefit. We are very close to two metro lines, both of which go into the district easily, very easily. And we're all hoping that once the pandemic comes to a close soon, we hope that we'll be able to do that again, get on the Metro, go to DC, do the things that we did in the past and socialize and go out to dinner and things like that. All of those things are extremely easy to do from the location that we're at at Collington. Now for me, the beauty of the campus was a very important aspect of our looking. Um, I like to walk and the grounds, the 125 plus acres of beautiful wood, wooded land is just the perfect environment to spend as much or as little time as you would like out in nature. We have um, paved trails. We also have unpaved trails through the woods, through the lakes, the ponds. It's, it's a beauty that is uh, in my life unsurpassed. I mean, I've never lived any place where I had a pond or a lake that I could watch the wildlife and see things like that. So, so it had that charm for me. Um, I had heard people say that sometimes men had a harder time adapting to community life. Um, I'm a people person and I, I went through my mother being in a CCRC very similar to Collington. So for me, it was a no brainer. I mean, I knew what to expect. And through me, my husband did also. But my experience here has not shown that men are any less community oriented than anybody else. There are innumerable activities available for everyone. 
And I think the beauty of it is, is that if you are a people person, you can find something to do every single minute of the day. If you're not, if you just want to sit back and read a book all day long, you can do that too. And nobody's going to say a thing about it. For me, um, I, I don't think I was here two weeks before I contacted the person who is in charge or who was in charge of the country store, our very popular convenience center in the uh, lower level of the clock tower. And within a week, I was working in the country store, which is, as Howard will say, it is the absolute perfect place to meet everybody because everybody needs a carton of milk or a carton of orange juice or a dozen eggs or ice cream, huh? a biggie. So working in the store is just a marvelous way to meet people. And, and I did. And before the pandemic, I think that I probably knew 95% of the people at Collington. Unfortunately, people are moving in that have that uh, disadvantage right now, but we're going to take care of that. That is all going to change when we get out of this hole that we're in right now. Now, for my husband, he loves to write. And so for him, it was a, a no-brainer, essentially, for him to join the memoir writing class and also a way to meet people who also enjoy doing those same um, things. And so they would meet once a week and they would write a paper about their life, their experiences, their childhoods, their houses. I mean, it was just, it was a wonderful thing to do. And it's still going on, um, but it's going on by Zoom, which is, eh, it's not quite the same as when you're sitting around the table and you can laugh and cry and hear people's stories and just think, wow, this place has some amazing people in it. So I think that when you look around Collington, you will see a incredibly diverse population. We have so many state department, teachers, professors, nurses, doctors. I mean, there's just no end to the talent that is here at Collington. So one more thing before I sign off, and that is that the sense of community never became clearer to me than several times when my husband's um, health was jeopardized significantly. And he was hospitalized, he was in rehab, and he was gone from my apartment and me for five weeks during a pandemic where I couldn't visit him. So, you know, it's one thing when you have a loved one in the hospital and you can go sit by their side and hold their hand and, you know, rub their neck and put lotion on their arms and things like that. But with a serious health public health issue, that all those things are impossible. And I think that the sense of community never became clearer to me than during those times when I was surrounded by love, support, um, hand-holding, shoulders. I mean, it was remarkable. You, you can't get any better than that. I mean, I loved where we lived in Annapolis, but honest to God, if you didn't have a dog, we didn't know you. And so um, here at Collington, you know, <laughs> we do know the people that have dogs, but we also know just about everybody else. So it's, my heart is here and that will never change. We never look back. Thank you. Well, I guess I'm next. Uh, my name is Glenn Johnson. Uh, I, we, my wife and I have lived at uh, Collingdon now for about four and a half years. Uh, we came in uh, September of uh, 2016. Uh, we are not from this area, either one of us. Uh, my wife uh, uh, grew up in, uh, partly in India uh, and partly in North Carolina. I grew up in Kentucky. And after we met and married, we lived for 50 years in Poughkeepsie, New York. Uh, so we're not, uh, we're not disturbed by the relative lack of snow in, uh, in at Collington. We're happy not to have the snow because we've had a, our fill of it for, for 50 years uh, in Poughkeepsie. Uh, so we've been here about four and a half years. Uh, when I stop and think about what I love most about Collington, I think uh, two things I would single out, three things really, two of them, were things that I uh, that attracted us to Collington to start with. 
uh, and they've been confirmed uh, by being here. Uh, the first of those is the, the residents uh, who are here. Uh, it's really quite striking to us to find the range of interest among the residents we have. Uh, the diversity that we have is, was really attractive to us uh, because we come, my wife and I come from diverse backgrounds uh, and diverse experiences. So we wanted that kind of diversity. And when I talk about diversity, I'm not just talking about ethnic diversity, although that's important and that is here, but also diversity of national background, diversity of geography from uh, significant numbers of people who come from the local area around here. So if you need to find out anything about the local area, there are people who can tell you about it. But there are also people who come from all over the country uh, and from all over the world with experiences living in various uh, parts of the world as well. And they can bring that experience to bear on discussions as well. A wide range of professional, uh, Joyce has referred to this, wide range of professional and work backgrounds, uh, people with experience in every field that you can imagine, and a wide range of religious uh, backgrounds as well. All of those things were very, very important to us. We knew something about Collington and we had some sense that Collington was fulfilled those desires on our part. Uh, because we had a couple of friends who lived here uh, before we came and we visited them uh, on occasion, even before we were looking for a CCRC ourselves. So we have been, uh, and I would say that since we have arrived here, we have come to like even more the diversity of the residents that we have here. Their, their engagement, uh, in their an involvement in their continued involvement in their professional and volunteer activities all around. The fact that they are as welcoming as they are, Joyce sort of hinted at this, but I think I would say that it is remarkable how welcoming people are. And yet at the same time, one wants to say, I've heard this about some other CCRCs, they are not clawing. They are respectful of privacy. So if you, if you are concerned with, with living on your own and not having being engaged in lots and lots of things, uh, there is that opportunity as well as many, many things to be involved in. Not only do we have the range of activities that Joyce was talking about, but if, if you find that there is no activity of the kind you're interested in, you can start one uh, and many people have uh, so that the range of activities that we have changes uh, a lot from year to year, depending on the interest of a lot of residents uh, who start things. Uh, since we've been here, that has all been confirmed as one of the things that is most attractive to us. The other thing that's most attractive to, was most attractive to us was the location. We looked at a number of CCRCs, both in the DC area and in, uh, in the New York area. Uh, our, uh, our, uh, we were particularly interested in the DC area because we have a daughter who lives in Washington, DC. <coughs> Excuse me, and we were interested in being in near her. But I have found, and my wife has found, that the experience of having the opportunities of living on this really quite spacious campus with wonderful walking areas, a beautiful lake, nice places to sit outdoors, a really rural setting, but in an urban environment. That combination is very, very important. And the things that you can do, Joyce referred to this, the things that you can do in Washington are very, very important. Uh, I've continued to be involved a little bit with the Fulbright uh, Commission. And that makes it very easy for me to hop on when the pandemic is not on, to hop on a, uh, a subway, a metro, and uh, go into town for various meetings and various activities, in addition to all the cultural uh, activities uh, that, uh, that uh, go on uh, there as well. And that has been 
confirmed also since we arrived as one of the things that, that we most importantly like uh, at Collington. And then I would say just to wind up to say something about the third thing I like most about Collington, which we didn't know about before we came and wasn't one of the things that particularly attracted us to it, but has become very important now and particularly during the pandemic. And that is the Collington staff. Uh, it is really quite remarkable, the engagement of the Collington staff with this institution and with the residents uh, here. Uh, for most of the Collington staff, I would say, this is not just a job, uh, it's really a calling. Uh, and uh, most, many of them have become friends uh, since we got here. And particularly during the, the uh, shutdowns of the pandemic, uh, it has been very important, I think to all of us, particularly my wife and I have commented on this repeatedly, it has been most important to us uh, to have that kind of, of engagement with the staff who care for us uh, and who engage with us uh, in uh, very, very uh, important ways. So what do I like most about Collington? The residents, the location, and the staff. Thanks. Glenn, thank you so much. Uh, so far, you know, we've we've done this once before via Zoom, and um, that was back in the fall. And each time, I feel like, even though I've been here ten years, I feel like I'm learning a little bit more about not only the residents that are presenting, but really more about Collington. So, I'd like if uh, you could, Sue, if you could uh, kind of hop on and join in on your thoughts about what it's like to live here. You're on mute, Sue. There we go. Time. Sorry about that. Um, I'm the newbie. I'm Sue Blanchett. I've been here, we've been here almost six months. End, end of February, we'll have been here six months. Um, so to someone asked a question about moving in COVID, I'm your person. Because I moved, we moved across country from Texas in the middle of the pandemic, nine weeks after I had a total knee replacement. So I, I, we sort of multiplied every problem you could have to get here. Um, and it worked out just fine. Um, COVID has made it a little bit more difficult to become a, net, a part of the community. The meet and greet things that normally would have happened weren't allowed to happen. And so it meant a little bit of a push on our part. We had to put ourselves out a little bit to get involved, but it worked out just fine. Our, the, our immediate neighbors were there the day we moved in with help and support and lunch and you name it. Um, and so the whole, the whole community idea has been the biggest draw for us since we got here and, and coming in. Getting here was about a seven year process of me visiting a friend who has lived, a, a friend that we've had for years. We started out in Connecticut. My husband and I were high school sweethearts, oh my God. And um, picked up and moved to Texas for his job 40, 45 years ago. Lived there for 43 years. And then at one point I said, okay, you know, I wanna go back East. I wanna go home, but I don't wanna go back to Connecticut. Didn't want to deal, I like snow, but I don't like snow that much. Um, and so we started looking up and down the East Coast at different places. Um, there were places we looked at that the buildings were shinier and, but this had everything. It had the community feel of the people we, of, of people. It gave us a combination of rural and urban because I'm a city girl, don't, don't put me out in the middle of the boonies. One of the places we looked at was way out in the boonies. I said, nah, but my husband said, I've lived in the city for all the time I've been married to you, I want rural. This gave us a wonderful combination of the two. So we can get out and walk and, and, and as everybody has said, the walking, I'm fascinated, I've decided I'm fascinated by geese. I never have lived where there's been geese and so, you know, I talk to the geese when I go for a walk, all right? So I'm a little nuts, what can I tell you? Um, the, but the environment has been very, very welcoming. 
Um, one of the things that if you're looking to move here is to look for a company that will do your unpacking. I absolutely recommend that because the movers came and dumped everything and the next day the unpacking company came and within six hours, 85% of my stuff was done. The boxes were unpacked and taken away. Things were up on the wall and it looked like home in six hours. And that was really, that was probably the best spent money I made. We did moving in here. Um, getting involved is as much or as little as you want to do. And the people on this panel have been giving me a hard time a little bit because I get up and go to exercise class every morning. Okay, please understand exercise class is outside. And there's this lovely core group of anywhere from five to 20 that get out there at nine o'clock in the morning. And they finally told us if it's below 30 that we shouldn't go to class. The class objects to that, by the way, for the record. Um, we're willing to get out there. Uh, I was, so we were out there in the snow this morning exercising. Now we're in a covered area and it's an, a gazebo type area. But this is something that has helped me tremendously to become part of Collington because I'm seeing these people and we're now learning how to recognize people with masks on, you know. Um, and this has been for me, the, my way into the community. Uh, my husband back in Texas used to deliver meals on wheels. What he got started doing is one of the delivery people that brings your packages when FedEx and all those guys come to the door, there's a cadre of folks here who will de deliver them and knock on your door and say, here's your package. And my husband has started to do that. And so this is how he's gotten involved in the community. Everybody's got their own thing. Now he's a ham, ham radio operator. And one of the things that attracted him to Collington was that lovely ham station up on the hill. I mean, we're driving around and the car is almost going out the road because his head is out the window looking at the head at the ham radio tower. I kind of knew at that point that we had a home when, when he saw that. Um, you've got an a, assortment of possibilities for living. You can, if you want to be in the apartments, you can be in the apartments. If you want more uh, space, then you can choose a cottage or a villa. And each one gives you your option. And depending on where you are, your neighbors are going to get you involved in doing games on the four court, on the court or the croquet court, or, you know, my, my neighbor has taken me walking through the woods, uh, which I never would have done on my own. If you're a dog person, this place is heaven. Um, my cat sits on the windowsill and watches the dogs go by. Uh, not a dog person. Um, but I, what I have found is that every, even the people who have a dog, the people who have dogs are cognizant of the fact that there's folks like me in this world that are not real dog people and they will hand me the treats that they carry in their pocket to feed the dogs so that the dogs like me. So I, that's, you know, that's, that's a, a funny little thing that goes with it. Um, I noticed on the list that somebody was asking about doctors. One of the nice things that I have found here, because of course we came in with no doctors and had to find doctors for everything. And there's a residence, the residents have put together a list of people that they recommend so that you can find, you can use MedStar, the clinic that's here as your, as your primary care, or you can go elsewhere and find one. So you, yes, you can use your own doctors. If you're living in the area, you can still use your own doctors. The MedStar people I have found for us as a primary care to be absolutely excellent. And my primary example of that is something that happened a couple of weeks ago. I had a negative reaction to meds, ended up MedStar. They took one look at me and called the ambulance and shipped me off to the emergency room. So that they're, they're very prompt and very good at what they're doing. Um, and so you've got that option or you can keep your own doctors and then you have this wonderful list of options out there that are tried and true by residents here. So you can call that resident and say, why do you like this doctor? And, and why do you think I should go to them? So for if you're like us moving from out of state where you've got to start the whole doctor thing from scratch, it's an excellent resource. And that's something that's run by the Residents Association. Um, we were 
we looked at four or five different places on the East Coast before we settled on Collington, dealing with Corey. Uh, and yes, there's a waiting list. Uh, any of these places, there's a waiting list. And it depends on what you want, how long you're gonna be here on the waiting list. Um, I think Corey, we were on the waiting list about a year. Is that, I think that's about right. Um, and certain types of housing are gonna, the list is gonna be longer. And, and, but that's true anywhere. Every single place that we talked to said waiting list a year to two years. And so that's why planning ahead on this is great because by the time you really kind of maybe need to be here, you're here and you're set to go. And we don't need to be here yet in terms of need, but it's so relaxing to not have to worry about stuff. And if I look at the menu and say, yeah, that doesn't appeal to me tonight, there's a great Chinese restaurant about five minutes away. Um, and so there's other options available to you that you can do. Uh, you know, you, right now we're going up to the uh, uh, dining hall, picking up our meals and bringing them back. Someday the dining hall will reopen again. I, we got about what, three weeks of that before it shut down again. So we have never experienced going to meals in the dining hall. The rest of these people can tell you more about that than I can. Um, so it is, you know, you've got to make some adjustments. You know, things don't always get done as fast as you would like them to. You know, if you could pick up the phone and call the guy and say, come fix this now. Uh, but things get fixed and things get done. And the people are what make this place. And that's the best thing. I the, So if you're asking me what's the best thing about Collington, it's the people at Collington. And that's the staff, that's the administration, that's the residents, that's everybody here. That's my recommendation. Okay. Sue, thank Power you. to you. Thank you, Sue. And I have to say, we did not pay her to say that the uh, staff, she said that first, if you notice, she was not paid. She might have been bribed a little, but she wasn't paid to say that first. So I'll, I'll, take, I'll, I'll, I'll take my two cents out of Corey later. <laughs> Sue, thank you. Thank you. And now we're going to have Mr. Uh, Rich Baritone, Howard Piggy. I have to share that um, I had an appointment here the other day, and um, they... We're, we, we are socially distancing, taking uh, appointments for folks that are ready, you know, to select their homes. And we were walking down the hallway and we heard from the Interfaith Chapel, this, this lovely, rich baritone voice practicing music and uh, singing. And um, we ended up sitting in the game room, which is adjacent to the Interfaith Chapel. And... Um, I have to be honest, Howard, the, the two of us as we were meeting were, were kind of talking less and listening more. So, <laughs> so um, I want you to have an opportunity as well to share a little bit about your experiences here and uh, take it away, Howard. Well, thank you very much. Uh, but thank heavens that's over with because uh, we did the uh, TV thing with the uh, residents, artists and residents last night and that's done. On to the next thing. Um, I would like to echo open by echoing uh what everyone else has said um in a sense uh because we were living in uh, virginia uh in support of our younger daughter and her family and i thought this would be where we would stay because they had gotten a place that had all the uh, capabilities to live in on one floor etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, but then she moved to north carolina and our oldest daughter decided to adopt as a single mom uh, approaching her 50s, an infant. And uh, so then our whole focus changed and we began to look at uh, places, what do we need to do in order to support her? And uh, she's living here in College Park in Maryland. And so um, we began by scribing a uh, circumference around the area and then began researching all of the places within that uh, and then finally getting down to about eight places or so to uh, actually gather more detailed information and visit uh, and moving on from there. Um, 
some of the things that we uh, attempted to focus on was the diversity of the community, uh, the characteristics of the community, uh, the age, the operational capabilities of the uh, staffing and the people that were there, et cetera. And uh, so after we had stayed in a few places uh, to test them out, we were able to come here. We were dealing with Tia. She connected us, so we were able to come here and spend uh, a couple of days. And then later on, we returned uh, to spend another uh, few days uh, across the weekend when uh, the administrative staff is not present and you get to see what the place is really all about because uh, you're dealing directly with the uh, residents who are, who are here. Uh, and it was uh, very interesting. I will say in a descriptive term that what we have found is that the, uh, that the characteristics of Collington's community are not just uh, diverse as Glenn and others have, re have said in terms of uh, ethnic background, religious background, uh, uh, LGBT background, uh, languages that they speak, uh, the things that they like to eat, and uh, just a variety of concepts and uh, of different experience levels from around the globe, having been local or having traveled the world. Um, so it was, a, uh, it was an interesting and learning experience. Um, I tend to use a descriptive term, which I don't share with the staff here, when I speak to others, when they say, well, what do you say about Collington and people's ability to participate? And I tell them, I said, well, you know, Collington, uh, if you ever uh, uh, saw things like one flew over the cuckoo's nest, uh, that Collington is like an asylum that's run by the inmates. And so we as the residents get to participate in a variety of the things that, that happen here. Uh, and uh, if a person has something that they like, as, uh, as was just referenced, and they don't see it, then they go about uh, starting it. And so we've had people come here and begin to do pickleball. We have bird watchers, we have camera clubs. Uh, we have a lot of people that like gardening and we have a greenhouse and a, a full blown uh, floral shop with a cool box uh, and a variety of things like that because all of the flowers that you will see around inside the building are all uh, live flowers and not uh, there are no artificial uh, floral bank uh, arrangements or anything of that nature. Uh, we have various other groups and committees that like to work on things like the grounds committee uh, around the area, uh, working on various things around how we manage and, and handle the grounds. And then the uh, shops and so forth have already been mentioned. Um, and the thing that I like to do is she was just referencing the sing, and we have a uh, choir here that was uh, about 70 people, between 60 and 70 volunteers. Uh, and we were led by a uh, woman, Marilyn, Marilyn, who uh, was a professional uh, choir mistress master in, uh, in New York City, uh, who is our volunteer director. And of course, we can't meet right now. But once, hopefully, that this is over, we will begin to gather and sing again. Uh, we perform a couple of times a year. And there, additionally, there's a drama club uh, here for people that like to do drama, uh, just a variety of things. Uh, upstairs is an art room. And uh, the people who do art instruction up there are residents who come to teach other residents and transfer their skills. Uh, or you can just go up there and do whatever you like to do, paint, draw, sculpt, whatever it is that you like to do, you can do that uh, up there on your own. You just sign in on the sheet to use or reserve the room and go from there. Um, then there are other groups around who do things like uh, keeping up the buildings and working with the facilities uh, staff here to help uh, in working together and guiding and doing projects uh, for our buildings and grounds uh, as they uh, continue to try to maintain them. One of the things I like to work in is we have here a uh, closed circuit television uh, operation that uh, runs uh, for all of the residents here in Collington. And for a lot of our residents who are not necessarily digitally uh, 
oriented. They don't have a computer sometimes or smartphone or anything like that. So the printed media or the TV are the ways that they are able to understand what's going on here in addition to talking to their neighbors, et cetera. Uh, that's one of our primary ways of communicating. It's one of our primary ways of entertaining, educating, and so forth and so on. So we try to keep that going uh, as much as possible. Uh, that is basically old, is operated uh, in its entirety by residents uh, in terms of all the broadcasting and things that happen from there, the programs, et cetera. Um, and we have technology committee for those who like to deal with technology because um, they are committee people help other people who have technological issues with their computers or phones or other things that are here on the campus. Um, and so uh, because there's not enough uh, time in the day and uh, capabilities of our on board staff, they have to take care of some other things around the structures uh, that uh, all of our residents support in that sense is given by a technology committee. There are people who like book clubs. Uh, and so there are a variety of book clubs. Uh, there are people who love to swim, do water sports uh, like my wife. Uh, and so uh, there's a resident who does a lot of the water sport and in, uh, water instruction, as well as uh, Collington provides a lifeguard uh, at the pool. And so you can go down, there's open swim time, variety of other things uh, like that. Whenever uh, anyone moves here, everyone that moves here automatically becomes a member of what is called the Residents Association. There's no membership fee. There's no membership application. There's nothing. When you move in, you're a member of the Residents Association. And the Residents Association is the thing by through which we work as we're wanting to introduce new activities or get money to buy new equipment or things of that nature. And one of the ways that the Residents Association uh, earns money to spend on these things is we have uh, a shop, which we call it Opportunity Shop, OO Shop, uh, which takes, uh, well, uh, things that are a, a, a nice enough to be resold whether it's furniture, clothing, or things of that nature. And uh, they keep that down in the shop and then others come through and pay uh, minuscule contributions for those things. And that money all goes to the Residents Association for activities. And so whether it's, uh, you know, there's just a variety of activities that go on that require ping pong equipment or this or that or the other. Um, and so those things are available for all of us to uh, to use. Uh, I think a couple of our people had mentioned the fact of going downtown when things are back on a more normalized basis. We have a uh, group called the Trips Committee, and they are the people that get together and decide what kind of trips our buses should make uh, to where, whether it's Baltimore, Annapolis, Washington, uh, and for what activities. And so one can then sign up to take a trip to an activity. Uh, you get dropped off at the front door, picked up at the front door, no parking, no anything. You just go on in, come on out, you're back home in 30, 40, 45 minutes. Um, so those become really uh, wonderful ways to attend a variety of, of things that have an interest to you. Uh, whether it could be a play, it could be musical performance, just a variety of a variety of things. Um, and so uh, I think that you know you can go on and on about uh, the various things that in fact are available and the things that may not be available, but two of the residents, three of the residents get together and decide, hey, this is something we want to start. You know, we want to do. Uh, wheelchair volleyball or whatever and so then they begin and they figure out what we have to do and we uh, get that going uh, and then kind of go on from there so uh that's how uh i think the, the how i would describe that the diverse activities thoughts 
and concepts of how we operate here. Uh, but uh, I would chime in and say, as all of the people before me have said, that when we looked around, when we interacted with people, when we asked questions, when we looked at the propositions, uh, that by far and large, uh, Collington uh, came out way ahead of anything else that we comparatively uh, were researching. And uh, in that sense, it has not been uh, each, each few weeks is a new awakening, a new learning. And so uh, there's ongoing opportunities to, uh, to do things here. Um, and above all, I think that the people that move here accept the concept that we are a community. Uh, like Joyce was saying earlier, uh, we, our job is to take care of and watch out for each other. Some of our residents start off in independent living and then move into more uh, additional levels of care. They may move to a different location on the campus uh, where care is more acute and the other residents still continue to stay in contact with them uh, and so that all of the times that they understand that we're all a caring community, no matter where we, where we reside at the moment. And of course, with the pandemic, it's been very difficult because there's been a line uh, that has been created of necessity by the health uh, organization. And uh, there is no movement back and forth between the uh, more, uh, nursing places, high levels of nursing and so forth than the independent living, but still by, as I said before, either using the television, uh, using other ways of communication, sending cards, having calls, uh, we all try to stay uh, in touch with each other uh, as a community uh, should. Uh, so I think uh, with that, uh, it really covers uh, most of the things that I'm interested in. If you've been here or seen you, you know that there's a lake down there and uh, there's a paddle boat on the lake. So you can go down and get in a paddle boat, and paddle yourself around. I put your canoe down there and go canoeing. There have been people down there fishing, uh, all those things that I don't do. So, but I've seen them. So I know they're here. Uh, I figure that the water gets over five and a half feet. I can't stand up in it and I, I stay away from it. And that includes the pool. Uh, for 10, 12 years, I owned a pool in Texas and I was probably in that pool maybe four or five times when something fell in it. But uh, other than that, I stay out of it, you know. Uh, so uh, I guess we'll turn it back over to our marketing organization uh, for any questions or things that we may be able to respond to. Howard, thank you so much. I, I always get a good chuckle with some of, some of your analogies and stories. Um, and I, I wanna thank all four of you because as I mentioned earlier, I learned a little bit more about each of you um, and more about Collington. So we do have some questions that have been coming in and I'll just kind of field them out um, and then each of the residents will have a chance to um, answer so if, if, you feel, if you feel compelled. So we did have a question, and I think this is a fair question um, because, you know, we're hearing how much we love Collington and it's apropos given that it's Valentine's Day approaching. What would you say, is there anything that you could think of that I don't want to say is negative, but maybe something that you think well, yeah, what, it, what, what are some hesitancies that you've had? Are there any that you've had about, about moving or living here? Wow, nobody feels that. <laughs> <laughs> Sue, Sue does. Sue Blanchett. I looked at that question and I, I try to decide how to answer it. It takes a while to get stuff done. And part of that is that there's so many of us here and there's a limited staff. But when you put in a work order, sometimes it takes longer than it should to get things done. Part of that is to do with COVID, I know. And, but that, and so that can be, depending on how major or minor your problem is, that can 
be frustrating on occasion. It gets done eventually, but getting things done is not, you know, when you're in your own house, you pick up the phone, you call, and you say, the guy says, I'll be there tomorrow, or I'll be there next week, and you say, if it's next week, I don't want you. We don't quite have that flexibility. So that, that, that has been a problem, but, you know, when they get here, it gets done. It's just, that would be the only, that would be the one thing I have come up against since I moved in. And those that have been here longer uh, probably can address that better than I can because they would know what, what it was like pre-COVID. I'm dealing with COVID restrictions as well, where workmen can't come on campus and stuff like that. But so that, that would be, that was, when I saw that question, that was the one thing that popped to mind. Uh, that, yeah, okay, I'll be quiet. But as long as you open the floor up, I'm gonna answer it. Part of, thank you, Sue. Part of our Quaker values is transparency. So, you know, we, we wanna ensure that that folks have the answers that they need. Um, is there anyone else that would like to contribute to that question? Or do you think that Sue was able to answer it on your behalf? I would, I might add just a word. I don't find anything uh, at Collington that is uh, negative or concerning that I don't think exists at other CTRCs. I think wherever you go and live in a community uh, sort of where there is uh, a lot of shared services and a lot of shared activities, you're going to run into uh, problems. And that's why some people are hesitant about moving. I have to confess that when, when my wife and I were talking about this, she was much more eager to move than I was. Uh, I had lots of friends where I, where I lived before, lots of activities that I was involved in. The process of getting involved in a whole new set of activities, making a whole new set of friends. All of that was very, uh, how shall I say, disconcerting to me. Uh, and uh, I don't know, I, I think it's in some ways not as bad as I thought it was going to be uh, when I moved in. Uh, and a lot of it now is not as worrisome to me as it was. But I think still, there are problems when you, if you're hesitant about that sort of thing, there are, uh, those problems do continue or do exist when you move into a different kind of setting in which you have to deal with different kinds of problems. You have to organize yourself to go to dinner at certain times. Uh, you have to deal with a kind of uh, regimentation of activity uh, that doesn't exist or that you are, have more control over when you're living by yourself uh, somewhere. Uh, I, I, my observation from what I've seen of friends who live in other co co uh, continuing care communities is that Collington is no worse, maybe a little, little better than a lot of the others, but that those problems do exist in all uh, living conditions of this type. Len, thank you. Thanks again for your transparency. We appreciate it. We have a, a question for Joyce. Um, so Joyce, the question was asked, you know, when your husband was hospitalized, was he, did he end up moving temporarily into our health center here at Collington? So it's a two-part question. And also, can you use your own doctors? Okay. Um, when the clinic here at Collington became operational, we were given a choice of switching from our primary doctor wherever we lived to using the Collington Clinic as our primary care physician or using the clinic at Collington as our urgent care physician. Now, my husband and I lived in Annapolis, which is about 30 miles away from uh, Collington, and we had established for 20 years a wonderful primary care facility. So we chose at that time to use the Collington Clinic as urgent care only. Um, in September, my husband spent a week in the hospital in Annapolis. Um, he had some significant mobility issues which needed physical therapy. So when he was discharged from the hospital, he was admitted to the physical therapy unit here at Collington, where he spent four additional weeks having rehab. 
during that time, it became very clear to me that as wonderful as our physician in Annapolis was, he was 30 miles away. And the day Carl was admitted to the rehab unit here at Collington, I went down to the clinic and signed up for primary care because I wanted to make sure that regardless of what the medical issue was that was besetting us, I would have an opportunity to get on-site care. And so I have never looked back from that. I am extraordinarily happy with the care that we've gotten. I mean, my husband is seen once a week, either by telehealth or in the clinic. His blood is taken care of. I mean, I couldn't be happier. None of these things would have been possible if we had to drive to Annapolis to have blood drawn twice a week. That just would never have happened. So yes, we had in-house hospitalization at a regular hospital, four weeks in the Collington rehab. And now we have switched our primary care to the Collington Clinic. And we are so glad we did. Hope Thank that you. answers your question. Thank you, Joyce. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of this, um, this webinar, the residents have offered in the past, and I'm sure they'd be willing again, that if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us in marketing and we can certainly farm them out to any of the four of these, these individuals and they'd be happy to answer them for you. So um, uh, I'm gonna ask a question of Corey, um, given because we've had several discussions of, uh, of late about this, do, does Collington have any plans to grow? And um, are we fully developed? Um, and where do you see Collington in five to 10 years? Thanks for giving me that question. M much obliged, Ann. <laughs> I, I, I would say perhaps. Uh, for the past few years, uh, Collington has been engaged in a master planning process. Um, and as some of our friends have said today, decision making is indeed a process. Um, I, I think if you look back, Collington is 30 plus years old. We've, we've been around a while. So the genesis of this whole master planning process started with a group of residents that called themselves the Health Service Alliance. Um, and they advocate for residents in, in long-term care, among other things. So part of their mission or commission was to look at long-term care, i.e. assisted living, memory care, skilled nursing, and rehab. Our scores speak for themselves. If you look at our Medicare ratings, if you look at our zero deficiency surveys, but Collins has been around for three decades. So the philosophy of care, the way the care is delivered has changed a lot in, in three plus decades. The part of what the HSA did is put together, if you will, a wish list of how can we reconstitute this area of canvas? How can we do a better job delivering care? And it wasn't only the superficials. It wasn't only updating the building aesthetically. It looked at how can we better deliver a patient-driven model, which is our philosophy. Well, Collington isn't a standalone. We don't, we don't operate in a vacuum. We're part of a system, a group called Kendall. Uh, so we have 14 sister communities throughout the country, which means we don't have to make decisions in a vacuum. We, we can rely on some best practices, some lessons learned, what to do, what not to do from sister communities. And one of Kendall's recommendations was, if you're gonna look at updating your health center, why not step back and look at the entire campus? Uh, you might be able to improve efficiencies, economies of scale, and set yourself up for, for the future. So we, we took kind of a broader look at what kind of updating we would need to do to our campus. We brought in some architectural partners, and we began to put a price tag on this wish list. The, um, the price tag, a little bit like my son's holiday list, it was 50, 60 plus million dollars. So what we've been doing is, is going through and reprioritizing and deciding, you know, what are our priorities? One of the ways that small non-for-profit communities like Collington fund projects of that magnitude is through, is through new construction. It's taking the margins from entry fees from new construction and updating current infrastructure. Um, as you can imagine, that's elicited all kinds of passionate responses from the community. Uh, people feel strongly about that. So where we are now in our planning process is trying to figure out what our priorities are, trying to reach some consensus to set us up for 
the next 30 years? The short answer is we haven't decided yet. We have a lot of smart people who've been working for years, a lot of different ideas, but we are a community, so we have to reach consensus. Um, so my short answer is yeah. Thank you, Corey. Thank you. Um, I know that's a question that comes up often with even some of our, our visitors that come in. Um, so I, I, there's a question that came up and I'm going to uh, answer part of it because I'm just so proud of it. So anyone that knows me knows that I have a hard time keeping my mouth shut. Um, but a question that came up, how many people at Collington residents and staff have had the COVID vaccine? So I wanna share from a team member perspective, and then I'd love for the residents to chime in and Tia, um, you know, this is one of the reasons why people move here is, is you know, safety. Um, so I'm pleased to share that we received probably one of the best Christmas gifts you can get during this time in the fact that uh, three days before Christmas, we were notified that um, CVS would be coming on campus to administer the first shot for the Pfizer vaccine. Um, and they came the day after Christmas. So the uh, December 26th, we had uh, all of, well, not all, but predominantly most of our health center residents and then a large contingency of our team members vaccinated. What we didn't know back then, and we didn't find out until two and a half weeks later, is that we were going to have the opportunity to also kind of be ahead of the curve and vaccinate our independent living residents. So we vaccinated, it was about three weeks ago, we vaccinated over 600 people in a 48 hour period. Um, <laughs> which anyone on this call saw us running around like chickens with our heads cut off. It was a, uh, it was a noble effort, but uh, we had to work a little bit of the kinks out uh, logistically, but we were incredibly fortunate to be able to vaccinate over 600 people in a very short window of time with really not a lot of notice. Um, I want to follow up and, and share that we were, uh, we vaccinated the second round of vaccines, 95% of our independent living residents were vaccinated their second shot, um, as well as our team members, and 90, no, 100% of our health center residents have been vaccinated. So that just happened this past weekend, and um, we are, we are so fortunate. Um, and the reason I share that is, first of all, it was a question, but second of all, some of you observing right now can probably commiserate. My 86 year old father is still waiting to get vaccinated. Um, so the fact that we were able to have those we care about here on campus vaccinated in such a timely man manner um, is something that I'm incredibly grateful for and proud of. So um, I hope that answered your question, but if any residents would like to chime in about the vaccination or Tia, if you'd like to join in, we'd appreciate any feedback you have. Thank you, Sandy. Hello, all. Um, you know, initially, I will say from a personal standpoint, I did have some apprehensions and about the vaccination and you know, I, I, I actually did not do it the first go round. And um, I do have some underlying issues going on. And, and so um, there was some, uh, a little bit more research on my behalf. And there was also speaking, you know, to my physician, but going back to what Sandy was talking about and you were talking about your father, um, I thought about uh, not just the residents, but I also thought about my mother. I thought about my aunts. I thought about my uncles um, and them understanding the issues that I contend with that they actually do not, but still they, they had so those apprehensions as well. And so it made me say, I'm going to do this, if not just for me, but for them, but for the residents as well, because uh, as, as Joyce and the residents alluded to, you know, we are community. And in order for me to 
come back to the community in a safe manner. And that's always our first priority is keeping our residents safe. You know, I wanted to have that vaccination for them as well. Um, do you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so I, I will say this, and, and, and maybe I'm, I am proud about this and maybe I shouldn't be bragging about it, but one of um, my, our, my associates who actually works in uh, a competitor at a competitor, um, they were even mentioning that they weren't even offering the vaccination to their residents. So I was extremely proud about that, that Collington's residents actually had the opportunity to receive the, some of the first to receive the vaccinations in the state of Maryland. So I was very proud about that. Thank you, Tia. Anyone else want to chime in? Yeah, I just have a question, Sandy. Uh, was the question that was posed by the persons about the experience that we had here, not the vaccination experience, but the experience of exposure to COVID, uh, or was it about vaccinations? It was primarily about vaccinations, Howard. So it was a question of how many people were vaccinated. But if you would like to expand on um, any more COVID, COVID concerns, that would be welcome. No, I thought that uh, the uh, programs that had been put into place, you know, the level of communication between our uh, senior staff uh, back and forth between the county, uh, the state, uh, and the CDC, and so forth and so on in terms of knowing what to do, when to do it, and how to get it quickly done uh, was uh, really a great effort in trying to keep us uh, insulated, if you will, and that uh, that thing basically kind of shown itself out in terms of the numbers and then on a week to week basis and sometimes even less than a week to week basis that we were being updated uh, with a presentation of what was going on, uh, what had happened, what was the exposure among residents, exposure among staff, et cetera, et cetera so that uh, everyone would have that understanding and fear would not be our major motivator. And uh, I think that that's uh, very important for people to know that that level of communication was taking place so people were not listening to hearsay or operating on fear. Mm -hmm. Sandy, I also wanna say that I think that we have been incredibly lucky in the ability to get that injection, those two injections. And I think one of the things that we see every day and we hear every day on the television are these lines that are forming. And the thing about it that just breaks my heart is that the category of the people, the older people that are not computer literate, that have such a hard time getting on, can't get on the phone, can't get on a computer, are relaying, relying on people called um, vaccine angels to help them through getting this uh, process started. I, I can't say enough about how fortunate I feel I, I was just to walk over, get my shot, come home, done. So I'm Collington has really stepped up to the plate and the liaison that they've had with CBS has been fantastic. I That's all I have to say, they're, they're terrific, goodbye. <laughs> I'd like to just add a, a quick word to that too because I agree with everything that's been said about the vaccination and how lucky we were, uh, have been to have it handled the way that it was. But I think it's part of the overall uh, safety that we've had from the administration of Collington. I, my wife and I have commented on it repeatedly that throughout this whole pandemic, we have been kept remarkably safe uh, by the ways in which things have, have been handled uh, here and the ways in which people have been kept informed uh, of what has been going on. And that is uh, true even though we live in a county which has a very high incidence of infection uh, from the, from the uh, virus. Uh, and yet we have been kept remarkably safe. Uh, we've had relatively few uh, cases uh, on the campus compared to most uh, facilities of this kind, uh, and we have been very well kept informed and very well kept safe uh, by the by the way in which this has been handled. Um, thank you. Sue, uh, you wanna, yeah, there you go. Yep. Uh, I, I will just add my story to this that my 84-year-old sister 
sat in line for six hours in Florida to get a shot, okay? I am the envy of my sister. I am the envy of my Texas friends who are still waiting, have been on multiple lists. And so I cannot sing your praises high enough for how smoothly it ran here. And we just bang, 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 like Joyce said, and, we're the, and we had it. And we didn't have to put forth any effort. And we can't thank you enough for all that went into that. Thank you. Wow. We owe more than just two cents to everybody today. <laughs> um, thank every, I want to thank you. I know we ran a little bit later than we planned, but I think the, the information that, that each of you shared was incredibly important. And um, I want to just say again, how fortunate I feel to count you not only as uh, residents, but friends. So, um, we wish everyone on this webinar well. We hope you're safe. And um, if you'd like any additional information from any of us, feel free to reach out. And um, I think with that, we'll say farewell. I know we do have a couple questions we didn't answer, but I will make sure that the residency council reaches out to you directly. So Avita Zane and um, hi, Pat. And uh, we will see you hopefully soon. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.